Hey everyone, and welcome to another episode of The Family Couch. I am so excited to have on as our guest today, Dr. Abby Wiseman, and we're going to be talking about the trans identity and what that looks like in the professional world, what that looks like in our world in general, and to help just bring more awareness and um, knowledge to our understanding of this world. So thank you so much, Abby, for being on with us today. Thank you for having me. I'm excited. <laughs> so Abby, can you tell us a little bit more about who you are and what you do? Who I am and what I do. Um, <laughs> I'm a psychologist, a clinical psychologist in California. Very excited um, to be able to say that after many years of study. Um, and I have a private practice out of two locations in the San Diego Bay Area. Nice. And you primarily work with... Ooh. Ah, there's that part. Um, <laughs> people who identify as transgender and those who love them. Mm -hmm. and a special focus on people who identify as queer. Um, and I tend to work with people who are social justicely minded mm -hmm. as well. And is that because you yourself have that same kind of idea where it's like you identify in the community and you're socially, you know, justice minded or how that come about for you to work in this population? I'm not really sure, um, but I did notice that often when I talk with people and on all of the statements about me, I do mention that I will talk about power and privilege within the room and in the world outside. And that mm -hmm. I don't think that um, I don't think that it's just about the relationship between the therapist and the client, mm -hmm. as if the power dynamics in our societies don't exist. Right. Right. So let's jump into kind of what this looks like. And because I, I think the idea of the trans community and, and that whole kind of understanding has become something that's really in our knowledge now. It's in our vernacular now because of recent years, different celebrities, different events that have happened. And so for, for the purposes of the show, can you let us know what it means to be under the trans umbrella? Okay. Um, I think just like everything in psychology or, you know, pretty much anything out there in the world, it really depends on the person, mm -hmm. what their definition might be. Mm -hmm. um, for me, I use the term under the trans umbrella to mean anyone who is assigned a gender at birth that is different than the gender identity that they identify with now. Mm -hmm. So that can cover a lot of different people with a lot of different needs. Definitely. And so when you talk about gender identity, you're saying that there's more than just the male and female identities that we currently understand or use in, in our Western society. Yes. <laughs> Short answer, yes. Yeah, long answer. <laughs> long answer. Um, there are so many varieties of genders out there. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. um, and I find that I'm learning new ones every day um, that clients are letting me know about their gender identity using all sorts of terms. Mm -hmm. For instance, on their intake form or the intake sheet that I give them, I don't have check the box male or female. I have a blank line mm -hmm. and I allow them not just allow, encourage, support, um, cheer them on to put in whatever identity fits best with who they are. Yeah. And I've been amazed at the answers. It's fabulous. And I feel really lucky to know that there are all sorts of combinations that so, I never anticipated. And so can you like share like without breaching any confidentiality or anything, but can you share like just uh, ideas or examples of some identities that you've been able to, to work with? Um, I would say like a gender had been a newer term for me. Mm -hmm. um, and um. Demi, like Demi boy and Demi girl, um, and even terms like femme or butch and like a queer community mm -hmm. take on a different meaning when it's depending on the ethnicity or the race of the person, mm -hmm. the age of them, and if it's within a transgender population could be around clothes and also around just identity. So... And then when I think I know the answer and I feel all proud of myself, like, 
okay, I totally got this. Yeah. I, of course, have no idea, and I miss it completely uh, when the next person identifies as such. So I always ask how someone identifies um, and what those terms mean for them because I'm always learning. Right. It's never the same thing. And, and you mentioned the idea of culture and race, and do you feel like even in the trans community that there's still like this hierarchy, kind of a privilege based on your race maybe, or I would even say based on your appearance of how you may quote unquote now just for lack of a better term be able to pass yeah I think the passing thing is really dangerous because it implies that there is sort of a passing order and that it's important to pass and that's Mm -hmm. certainly something I hear a lot like will I be able to pass or Mm -hmm. do I look girl enough um are kind of the things and I think underlying that is this sense of violence like am I going to be okay am I going to be safe enough in this world Whereas you said, it's often with two genders. Mm -hmm. Um, And so what would it be like if I don't pass? Whereas other people will just take it on and call it a political statement or call it a sense of their identity is bigger or smaller than these two identities. Yeah. And they'll just be. Thank you. I appreciate the the clarity there because I think, again, being someone who is cisgender, I can, you know, trying to understand and be as aware and as um, understanding as I can be. I really appreciate when you can be like, hey, let's detour into some honest understanding here. I like it. So when we talk about the idea of like race, I guess, in culture, do you feel like there is still sometimes a hierarchy or a privilege that comes, even if you're in the transgender community, that based on your race or based on your culture, you may have more privilege than someone else? Oh, definitely. A deep idea, but. It is a deep idea. I mean, they often talk about, they, like the educators that have come before or currently, so I'm always learning. That's one of the reasons I love this job. (laughs) Um, Talks about if you are, um, if you are assigned female at birth and you identify as a man and you're a black man and you start off being a black woman, that your identity and your power in society will certainly change. Mm. And what is it like to walk in the world as a black man instead of as a black woman? How will people relate to you differently? What does fear look like? How will you be pigeonholed into things you didn't do that um, the institutionalized racism of our world will decide that you did based on Mm -hmm. your gender and your, your race? So we talk about that, or I... I bring that up a lot, yeah, certainly. And um, because my mini specialty within my slightly bigger specialty is around people who identify as Jewish and transgender. Mm. Mm. They're trying to look at what does it mean to identify as a Jewish man or a Jewish woman? How does that change what roles you might see yourself as having or your importance in different, um, different parts of the communities? So, and it's important. It's important that you just brought up the idea of religion as well, because I know for most, you know, organized religions, the mm-hmm. idea of being in the LGBT community, and if I don't have the right acronym, please feel okay. free to, to update me on it. But I think it, LGBTQIA, correct, for right now? <laughs> Sounds good. So if you're in that community, I know that most organized religions kind of don't have a space for you. I've heard that there's not really a big space for you. So how do you work with people who say this is my religious identity and then this is my you know sexual orientation or gender identity I love working with religion and sexuality and gender shockingly um I think there actually are a lot more spaces out there than I ever realized and so um there are a couple different like lists of them that I can send to you that will show what are the um what are the terms to look for to see if someone is friendly like reconciling in Christ, for instance, Mm -hmm. Um, or I can't think of any offhand, but like with the Lutheran church, if they're ELCA, if that's their synod versus the Missouri synod, that might mean that they're more liberal. Um, But then within that, you have to kind of think, well, okay, you're more liberal, so maybe you're lesbian and gay friendly, but how comfortable will you be if the person's transgender? Mm -hmm. So there's always like an extra step or two. And what if they're transgender and identify as a lesbian, then how are they going to be seen in this church or this synagogue or mosque or whatever the situation may be? There's more out there and there's a lot of queer synagogues, which I love. And there's the Metropolitan Community Church, which is awesome. Um, There's, there's a lot of Facebook groups, hidden secret ones. Good. So that people can really <laughs> connect safe. and yeah. feel safe. I mean, and I really, I'm oh, sorry. 
No, it's fine. I was gonna say, and you mentioned, you know, at this point, you said something about um, this. I forgot. God, I wanted mm-hmm. to ask you this question, but keep going with what you were saying, and I will come up. Oh. I, I <laughs> um, I was gonna say, I really like working with people who have religion and gender in their life, or religion and sexuality in their life. Mm-hmm. Um, I just, um, I like the idea that we can be both, and that we don't. We all speak as someone who identifies as under the trans umbrella and as a queer person, as a lesbian. Um, that I don't have to give up my Judaism in order to have my sexuality or my gender. Yes. That I can embrace both parts of my life um, or all parts of my life. And especially living in Southern California, where it feels like a lot of people aren't necessarily religious unless they're yeah. very conservative, yeah. um, it's nice to be able to have all. And it's nice to know that there is that inclusivity because I think someone, like, again, as I mentioned, I'm cisgender mm-hmm. and I do identify with the Christian faith. Sometimes I'm a little bit kind of boxed in with how I understand things. So it's really nice mm-hmm. to know that there are resources and I would love for you to send me that list to offer as a resource so that way you can be able to identify based on your religious identity where you can go to still get that spiritual kind of, you mm-hmm. know, um, a, a awareness and acceptance and still be able to identify in a way that's healthy to you in a way that feels right to you. Without, yeah. without fear of persecution or fear of being kicked out or fear of being you know, mocked or anything like that. Because mm-hmm. that could be a huge, that could be a huge issue if you're someone who still has a religious identity, but you don't know where to go to, you know, to still be out and to, and to be healthy with yourself. Yes. And so. Yes. And I'm yeah. smiling. Who does she mean be mocked by? Do you mean be mocked by the church or do you mean be mocked by the other LGBT people for inviting religion into their lives? It so could be. I think it's a little bit of both, though. I think, you know, again, yeah. I think in every in every identity, there are people who are going to feel like you should be over here and this is how you should be. I think even for, you know, your racial identity, if you're over here, then you're more your racial identity. If you're over here, yeah. then you're less <laughs> your racial identity. And I feel like that might even happen. And you can tell me in, in the LGBT community where it's like, if you're doing this, then you're more identified. And if you're doing this, then you're not as. Mm. Do you feel like that happens sometimes or... I I think it depends which world you're in. I think there are so many communities within a community that I can't tell you like the one answer. Um, I think it, I've certainly gone through, for me, I think it's been more around the social justice activism stuff. I've either been more in it, like, let me chain myself to something, like I'm ready now, or like, okay, well, I'm going to watch other people chain themselves to things and I'm happy to be here and support if, they need some like debriefing afterwards. So right. depending on what role I have, I found that um, that's changed over the years, yeah. but I'm not really sure how people see me so much as I see myself as having a different kind of energy. Yeah. I but I think it's healthy to be both. I think it's healthy sometimes to be an activist and to be very forward. And then there are times that I take that time to take care of yourself and say, I'm mm-hmm. here when you need, but I need to kind of sit myself down and reflect yes. for me first before I can chain myself to something I need to maybe reflect. Yeah. Yes. I think it's been really hard in recent, you know, days and if not now weeks, unfortunately that um, this drive in me at least to be like, I want to go to the airports. Like, what am I doing sitting here? I should be going Mm -hmm. at the airport. Mm -hmm. And then at the same time be thinking, no, you have clients to support and you have a business to support and you have yourself to support. And so how to, decide when it's time for me to march um, and when it's time for me to sit in protest and when my job becomes its own protest. Right. So. Right. And I like that. I like being able to have that activist spectrum where it's like sometimes just being mm-hmm. present in your practice for your clients is an act of protest, if you will, yes. just being there. Right. And then there are times when, yes, you physically need to be in the forefront mm-hmm. of a march or, or anything to feel that, that power. So I think they're both, I, I actually encourage people to do both. I think there are times when you do need to just say me, my present self here is just mm-hmm. as active as me being presently at a protest or at a march or anything like that. So it's healthy. I think it's a healthy balance. Yeah. I like this healthy thing. I'm a fan. <laughs> right. I mean, yes. I would say even having my office where it is, it's in sort of North, um, it depends on traffic, right? A half an hour to an hour north of San Diego. Mm-hmm. Not the area I'm supposed to be in as a queer. Mm. Um, and having an affirming practice, I'm supposed. it feels like I'm supposed to be in Hillcrest. Right. And so I think the fact that I have a practice in an inland area that's known as not the most liberal on the block or, you know, in the next 
couple yeah. miles. Um, that in itself was an act of protest. I agree with that. So. Go you. <laughs> Go Thanks. you. So my question came back to me. You mentioned oh, earlier, if you are a trans man and you're gay or if you're a trans woman and you're, you're lesbian. So there's sometimes this, uh, this uh, misunderstanding about your mm -hmm. gender identity and your sexual orientation. Oh, yeah. So can you help me understand the difference just for, for the audience and our listeners? What's the difference between gender identity and sexual orientation? Okay, so let's see. Good question, by the way. I just want to make sure I'm appreciating a question that comes up all the time. Yes. Um, and then some. Um, I'm trying to think of the best way to describe it, and I realize I don't have one. So here's my attempt. Okay. Um, so let's see. Um, sexuality has to do with who you're attracted to um, and what your romantic interests, your sexual interests, your heart interests, mm -hmm. um, your you know, your connection to, mm -hmm. um, or your lack of, mm -hmm. um, and your gender identity is something completely different. Yeah. Um, gender identity is, um, someone's, it depends who you ask what it means. And there's right now this gender unicorn, mm -hmm. which I really love and always pull up and show a diagram, but so just imagine a diagram here, but it's about what your sense of self is in terms of your gender. So, um, if you are assigned female or male or intersex at birth, um, what your genitals look like, what your DNA looks like. Um, okay. Blah. <laughs> Because, and that you're, you know, can you leave that in? It gets confusing if people do gender identity and sex yeah. and sexuality. And I like to just say, honestly, that there's the sexuality and sexual orientation and then gender and sex is the other category. Mm -hmm. That sexuality and sexual orientation is about the sexual acts that you might have, the behaviors, if you will. Okay. Um, and that gender identity is all about how someone perceives themselves as male, female, neither, all of the above, or any other fun combination. Right, right. And, and I appreciate that because I think, again, as we come into a world where the, there are more words, there, there's more dialogue about it, mm -hmm. I think really being able to distinguish what you just shared, which is what is my sexual orientation and what is my gender identity is gonna be really important as we learn how to yes. be inclusive and supportive. And, and not to try to point fingers and try to figure out what someone is. You know, my, my whole idea is that someone's gender and their sexual orientation is none of my business. You know, <laughs> so like yeah. however, however you present yourself, I think is what's to be accepted, you know? And I think that that's mm -hmm. something to me, and I'm sure for you professionally in, you know, as your activist or social justice self feels the same, mm -hmm. that it's really more so about just acceptance, would you say? Or, or is there something else there that we need to understand? I think it depends. The answer that I promised I'd never, ever give yeah. um, when I became licensed, and now it's all that I give, um, I think for people it can have a real political feel or um, depending on what stage of development identity they have yeah. around their sexual orientation or their gender identity or both, mm -hmm. um, it can be a real sense of pride or a sense of shame around these different parts mm -hmm. of someone. And so... It can also be a sense of pride too, like, oh, you recognize me for who I am. Oh right. my goodness, I'm doing this right. right. And while as a therapist, I wouldn't say there is a right. It's how you best feel in yourself, how comfy you feel in your skin. It can be very rewarding to show up and be seen. Right. Um, so I get torn. Yeah. Um, maybe, maybe it's a better idea to say holding a space for that person so you don't have a right or wrong mm -hmm. acceptance or denial. It's just more be like a space that you just give that person to be. Yeah. Or, or they take, you know, <laughs> I mean, depending on yeah. who is the active role in this, yeah. like, or just yeah. everyone has their own space and um, they can take up as much or as little as they need. And everyone has the, the amount of space that's best for them. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not taking it from someone else. Right. I think, um, yeah, I think that's what I would say. Yeah. And I, I'll ask this because I think as we get into this world where everyone kind of begins to feel comfortable identifying on the spectrum where they need to be, on whether mm -hmm. their gender identity or their sexual orientation, I want to know, like, for myself and whoever else out there is listening as an ally, as a cisgender heterosexual ally, what is the best way to be supportive and be an ally, continue to hold that space for our for people in their community or people in the community in general who identify okay. as LGBT or on that spectrum. 
this is a deep question. Yes. Um, <laughs> and I will, of course, just give one or two answers or three or four. Right. Um, and I would say it depends on the person and what they need. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of talk, though, about... Um, well, so there's this thing, like, on one hand, I would want an ally who would... I want an ally who is willing to be... Um, mislabeled as transgender or as LGBT or as LGB, mm-hmm. even for that brief second mm-hmm. without having to come out and be like, no, I'm straight. And no, 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 I'm not transgender. I'm cisgender. Mm-hmm. I think in that brief moment where there's that possibility that even you yourself could fit into that other role is so powerful. Yeah. It's like, Oh, there's not a shame that the person that the ally immediately has to distance themselves a little bit and say, no, that's not me. That's not me. So for me, it gives me chills even as I'm saying this to know that someone would be like, Oh, you know, to not have to correct. Right. And that second is brilliant. Um, But for others, it it might be the sense of the, give the mic over to the trans person. Mm. And most likely the trans person who is a person of color. Right. Um, and away, away from the white people. Um, I mean, I'm white. I'm talking about this on your thing. And I'm thinking, you know, uh, there's a lot of me's represented. Um, and it came up at the recent like, WPATH conference, for instance, where the trans women of color felt excluded um, and trying to get their voices heard. And I think they were in the end, which is pretty awesome. It's an amazing job. Um, but there's a lot of who's speaking for which community. And um, I'm a big fan of their many communities um, because what I will consider my own community is probably going to look really different for someone else. Right. Um, so. And I just want to say that it's really, it's really powerful what you said, because I think across the board, you know, as a 31 year old, there has been like a huge mm-hmm. kind of shift where we used to feel like, Oh, I'm not that, you know? And I love mm-hmm. that you said for me, an ally would just be someone who, if, you're identified as being in our community, as being in the, this umbrella community that you don't feel the need to immediately correct. Like for me, I said that and I was like, I want to be that ally. <laughs> like I just literally thought that. I was like, that's yes. right. And, and, and you have something. something. Thank you. And I think it's something that, again, it kind of helps us to kind of blur those lines of, of in the gender spectrum and the sexual mm-hmm. orientation spectrum where I don't feel like I have to say, even though I did, just for the purposes of being the of host course. and being here. But you don't have to say, you just say, I'm Mercedes, I'm Abby, hello. Right. And that be the extent of of who I have to identify or how I have Mm -hmm. to identify. In a perfect world, I think we would be able to get there. And I feel that way across the board, but I think especially because the trans identity has become so prominent in the past few years, Mm -hmm. thanks to media or not thanks to media, however you want to see it. (laughs) Yeah, because of the media, you know? Right, right. But for whatever reason, it's become part of our vernacular. And I think as we strive to look at how we're going to support and how are we going to be an ally and how are we going to maybe combat some of those myths? I think it's really important that you get comfortable being able mm-hmm. to do what you said, what, what your want is for an ally, right? I hope I'll say so. This, for people who are watching, if there is, you know, professional family member, parent who's watching and they're thinking, okay, how, what can I do next? What would you love for us to know about the trans community or, or people under the trans umbrella that would just help mm-hmm. us be more accepting and more supportive. Wow. Um, Task was such a big thing, I would say, to breathe, that um, there's a lot of overlap in all of these worlds. Um, And I would say if you are a clinician, um, that someone coming out to you as transgender or as maybe not the gender that they look like is such a gift. Mm -hmm. It must mean that they trusted you so much. Mm -hmm. Um, Because it it still is stigmatized, even though there's all these media figures out there, it's still derided and seen as, you know, touched or crazy. And I don't, I certainly don't believe that at all. But if someone were able to share with you who they are, um, I would encourage you to take a deep breath. And this maybe will go for not clinicians as well, friends. Maybe, you know, your beloved ones are coming out to you instead of laughing, even if it's like a nervous laugh or something like that. um, I'd encourage you to 
thank them for sharing it with a genuine spirit and appreciate how hard it must have been for them to tell you. Mm -hmm. Um, And if you can, if they're, you know, if it's not your client, if it's your friend or your mother, whoever it might be, um, to be able to say, I love you. I'm so glad that you came out to me. Thank you for trusting me with this. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, if you're a huggy family, give them a hug. If you're not a huggy family, don't give them a hug. but to really be there for them. And if you're a clinician to please not freak out, Um, you're always welcome to call someone like myself or other um, people who specialize in this community. And we're happy to walk you through um, what it could be like for your client and how to best support your client. Very empowering, Abby. Very empowering. Yay. And I know that we could talk all day about this subject. I have a million and one oh, questions so swirling in my head, but I definitely want to give okay. uh, you space to let our, our audience know more about how they can get in touch with you or get okay. you know some of your resources or just know more about you and your work. Oh, well, I would be honored and I appreciate it. Um, Okay, so a couple things. You can go to my website at any time, day or night, hopefully. Um, and that's www.doctorabby.com. Um, and if it's in Pacific time, you're welcome to give me a call at 619-403-5578. Um, Pacific time between the hours of like, let's say 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. <laughs> like, nice. I'm not an early bird person. I'm definitely not a late night person. So be right. kind. Right. Um, I will answer it as I can. But I'd love to hear from people. I love it. I love it. And for those of you who are listening and you were able to get down any of those resources, don't fret. The links and that number actually will be right there for you in the show notes. So if you'd like to contact Dr. Abby and get any support, whether it be someone who's ready to come out and and have that discussion, or if you want to support someone in your life who is Mm -hmm. under the umbrella, please feel free. She's an amazing resource, very empowering, very helpful. Very amazing. So thank you so much for being on Dr. Abby and sharing your experience and your expertise with us. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it.